if you'll turn in your Bibles as we're introducing to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to again thank our pastor for opening the pulpit to some of us who are hungry to teach, allowing me the opportunity to share specific things that I've, I'm interested in, that I'm studying. These are opportunities you don't have all the time. See, I... When I get up, I get to talk, today I'm going to talk about prayer and inner, in dialoguing with the Lord, having a dialogue with, with the Lord, which is of great interest to me. When you teach every week you, and you have that responsibility of being the educator of the church, like Pastor Ron, you don't get to do that. You have to follow a course where you're educating of the whole realm of doctrine. I get to pick and choose the things that are interesting to me, and I get to talk about them, and that's a lot of fun. So, plus, I know more than most everybody, and I get to sh show off. So, you know, because I spend all my time reading about it. I mean, these are things that I read for fun. You know, if you went to the my library, there'd be books out about these topics that I read for fun. So... The lady said, the lady on the radio said, my favorite winter sport is going back inside and drinking hot chocolate. Uh, and I can relate to that. I resemble that remark. Uh, I want to talk this morning about Paul's prayer life. There's several people in the Bible that developed this level of growth and intimacy with the Lord where they had a dialogue an interactive discussion. And you can see this in Paul's prayer this morning in 2 Corinthians 12. And I, years ago, uh, Bob Thiem called this preventative suffering, which is just a genius way of seeing the fact that uh, God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh, an, a chronic illness, I, I believe, that reminded him, hey, don't get too big for your britches. The moment you get too big for your britches, I'll show you what's in your britches. So it's a nice way of saying, there's not really a nice way of saying that, but anyway. Paul was caught up in the third heaven. He doesn't know whether he actually died and went there or whether it was a vision. And when he, when he was there, he saw and heard those things that were not allowed to be revealed. He, the Lord told him, do not, do not reveal these things to anyone. And he said, therefore, lest I exalt myself, which was his weakness. This was, this was Paul's tendency, was to, to crave and hunger for recognition. He wanted to be recognized for, to be, for being this super apostle, which he truly was. But before he got that recognition from anyone, and I don't know if he did in his lifetime, I know that some gave it to him, but many didn't, and he, you see him do all kind of things to gain approval, and therefore the Lord knew Paul, <laughs> Paul's going to have a hard time keeping his mouth shut about this, and therefore I'm going to give him a little help. So you might wonder sometimes why the Lord has allowed these difficulties in your life, chronic illness. You know, I was telling Patty that my knees at this point in my life hurt all the time, 24-7, all day long, all night long, blah, 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 you know. And, you know, the Lord said, be grateful. And I'm like, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. He said, this is, this is what this is about. I'm keeping you, of course, he's apparently he's keeping me from running, running the Mercedes Marathon. Uh, something bad were going to happen if I ran it, but anyway. Paul allows things, I mean, God allows things in our life to, to hinder our path in one way or the other to protect us, often from ourselves. And that's what you see with Paul. He's being protected from himself, from his own weaknesses. So the Lord gave him a thorn, which he describes as a demon, to hit him, to keep him humble. And he shares with us the dialogue that he had with the Lord. He asked the Lord three times, 
to remove it. The Lord reminded him of a lesson he had learned previously. And, and now what he's going to describe was what this particular exercise, this thorn in the flesh, was all about. So I want to see first in prayer, and this is something I learned years ago from Ron and from again from the carnal theme, but the prayer is God deals with prayer four different ways. First of all, you can make a petition and he'll answer it yes, and at the same time, the desire behind it, he answers yes. A great example of this is the cleansing of the leper. You know, the leper, in Matthew 8, the leper comes to Jesus and said, if you are willing, you can make me whole. And Jesus said, with, all, with great compassion, of course I'm willing. I'm willing. So the man wanted to be cleansed of his leprosy, and the desire behind it had a, we, we could talk all day about the desire behind he got both. He got cleansed, and he got the joy of being cleansed. So God said yes to both. Secondly, you can get the, your, God can say no to what you ask, your petition, and yet give you what you want. In the story of Abraham bartering with God for Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, God said, I'm going to come and destroy it. And, and Abraham barters, he said, if we can find 50 righteous Will you relent? And oh, yes, I will. And he gets him down. You know, this is where the term Jew comes from. I'm Jewish, so I can say all that. Oh, I mean, he got him down to however many it was, maybe 10. But what was his desire? To save Lot. He was about saving Lot's family. So God said no to the petition, but he said yes to the desire because Lot was rescued although the petition was no. The petition can be positive. Here's the one that's the most frustrating probably. Then you get what you ask for, but you don't get what you want. A good example is the demons that were in the man uh, that lived around the tombstones. You know, the, Jesus is discussing with the demons what's going to be their fate. And he's, he's commanded them to come out of this man. And they said, let us go in the pigs. Y'all know that story? Yeah, let us go in the pigs. And so he said, we'll go. So they jumped out of the man and flew over and got into the pigs. And then immediately the pigs got spooked, ran over the cliff, into the ocean and died. So he said yes to their request, but no to their desire. Be careful what you ask for. Fourthly, he can say no to the petition and no to the desire too. This is the rich man and Lazarus story where the rich man is in, in torment and he makes a request of Abraham. It's a prayer to the Lord and he says, you know, go and warn my brothers. Go and warn my brothers. And Abraham said, they're not going to listen. He said, if somebody would come back from the dead, if Lazarus would come back from the dead and go warn my brothers, trust me, they would listen. Abraham said, even if somebody rises from the dead, they will not listen. Did somebody rise from the dead? The Lord may or may not grant your specific request, but provide for the need or the desire behind it. You may ask for the wrong thing, and yet God, being compassionate and gracious, give you what you needed or wanted. He may give you all that you asked for, and yet give you nothing that you truly wanted. Isn't that something? He can give you everything you asked for, and yet your desire is not honorable. It's selfish. It's... it's ill-gotten gain, and yet you ask the Lord for it, and he may give you all of it, and still you be dissatisfied. No contentment. Paul's request was denied, but his desire was granted. So, let's look at verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. In verse 
7, he, he's picking up, uh, looking back at verse uh, 5. On behalf of a man I will boast, but on my own I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. He's about to explain this. He said, look, I'm not going to boast about the things I've done. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to boast about what's weak about me. Really interesting. I do not wish to boast. I shall not be foolish, for I shall be speaking the truth, but I refrain from this so that no one may credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. In verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, and he's talking about going to heaven and seeing these wonderful things that he's not allowed to talk about, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me. Now notice, that's a gift. Your suffering, listen to me, your suffering is a gift from the Lord. Stop complaining about it. Stop telling yourself that it should not be. It's a gift. You don't know what God's doing unless you're looking to see what God's doing, which Paul, look, Paul wasn't looking at first. Finally, he asked the right question, what is the Lord doing? So, in verse 7, he says, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me was given to keep me from exalting myself. Now, his tendency was to be conceited, to over-exalt himself, to be to covet approval. This word over-exalt is hooper iromai, and it's a present passive subjunctive, and it means to be exceedingly raised up. The passive verb indicates that the situation of knowing what no one else knew had the potential of pushing him into this situ this view of extreme self-importance. He knew what no one else knew. Not Peter, not James, not anybody. He had been given sight. He had seen and heard things that no one else who came back. Look, Jesus went to the grave and he came back from the grave and he went to heaven. Paul went to heaven and came back from heaven to the earth. He saw things in heaven that he couldn't talk about. I don't know what he saw. It's easy to speculate. Well, he saw things so great that if people knew about it, they'd just want to go ahead and go. I don't know. But Paul was not allowed. The situation itself was too much for him, and therefore God gave him a chronic suffering. A chronic suffering. This is for me, folks. That's for me. I mean, I, I know people suffer a lot more than I do, but I've had my share of it in the last few years physically. It's just chronic, and I've complained every step of the way. My wife will testify. Promised her over and over I will quit complaining about it, but she knows it's not true that... <sighs> I was talking to a friend yesterday and was complaining. Listen, this is so important. Listen to me clearly. Was complaining about a situation in his life. And I, and I stopped him in the middle of it and I said, I don't mean to be rude. But every time you describe this gift from God in this negative way, you reinforce within yourself the idea that this situation is wrong is bad. You'll never get to this place of gratitude for it that is victory in the Lord by talking about your situation like that. Stop doing it. He said, you're right. Let me tell you all about it. <laughs> Start it all over again. <laughs> Here we go again. He said, a messenger of Satan... This was a demon. He described as a demon. The people say all kinds of things, a chronic illness. Some think he had 
epilepsy. Some think he had some occasional problem. We don't know. He doesn't tell us. Paul's spiritual genius enabled him the capacity to know what couldn't be revealed. He knew his weak, God knew his weakness and was wanting, he, he knew that his weakness was wanting to be known for greatness. Paul wanted others to know how great he was. And, and look, was Paul great? He was immense. Immense. Incredible genius. And he wanted us to know. Well, he got his wish. He just didn't, he just wasn't living to know about it. So God allowed suffering in his life to help him avoid sin and self-promotion. God allowed suffering in his life to help him. To help him. Not to hurt him, to help him. Thank God for unanswered prayers. You've heard that saying. You know, Garth Brooks did a song. Thank God that I didn't get to marry that woman that I dated back in high school. We all have those thank gods. Thank God for the closed doors and the struggles in your life. Now, in verse 8, he says, Concerning this, this thorn in the flesh, this chronic suffering, I asked the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He begged the Lord, this parakaleo means to beg the Lord that the problem would depart. I know that well. Lord, how is this helping me become a better servant? How is this helping me become a better minister? How is this helping me? And he said, you're looking at it all wrong, son. It is helping you immensely. Not only is it keeping you from being things that you don't need to be, from achieving some level of recognition that would do nothing but hurt your family and destroy your life. I'm teaching you so many wonderful things for those that are coming behind you, so many wonderful things that you're going to be able to report and share with them. Look to me and be grateful. Everything I do in your life is for good. Will you say that with me? Everything that God does in my life is for good. Everything God does in my life is for good. You ought to say that the first thing every morning. Everything God allows in my life is for good. Absolute truth. You ought to reinforce it and reinforce it and reinforce it. Every time you hear yourself complain or begin to complain or begin to look at a situation that he's allowed as some negative shouldn't be in your life, you ought to stop and erase it out of your mind. Erase that. Get rid of it. Paul said, take off that old stuff. Take it off. Erase it. Eliminate it. And put the truth in there and say it again and again. Remind yourself over and over. That's how you program your mind. In verse 9, three times he asked, Father, take this away. And it says, and he had said to me. How does your Bible say it? But he said to me, look, this is the word lego, meaning to say in the perfect tense. The perfect tense indicates a process Y'all listen for just a second. Let me see your eyes. The perfect tense is a process reaching a conclusion. It becomes perfected, completed with ongoing results. When he says, and he had already in the past said to me, Paul is recalling something God had already taught him. When the third time he asked, take this away, and God said no, he finally woke up and said, uh, hmm, all right, what are we doing? What are we doing here, Father? Now, I remember I wrote that Romans 8, 28, 
All things work together. God works it all together for good. Everything God does in my life is for good. And therefore, if this is for good, what are we doing? What good are we doing? Listen, when adversity comes to your life, it ought to be the first question that you ask. Father, what good are you working? What good are you using my life to work in someone else's? And you start start looking for it. What good are we producing here? Because that's exactly what's happening. God is not after you. He's not out to hurt you. He's not out to punish you. Not out to get you. He's working good. Always. God is good. All the time. What God produces in your life is good. All the time. The questions you ask yourself, the things that you say to yourself, we've been talking inner inner dialogue from this pulpit for years now, explaining to you that what you say inside of yourself is literally the control system for how you believe, think, feel, say, and do. It's the control system. It's the steering wheel. What you say to yourself and how you picture it in your mind, when it's you and you, you've gone to the old man. You've gone to the worldly system that's still in you, and you're operating off of that viewpoint. But when your dialogue is with the Spirit, then you've gone to the new man. That's where Paul finally went. He's going to the old man going, man, get this off of me. This this hurts. I can't function. God said, oh, yeah, you can. I'm making you helpless. I'm showing you how helpless that you are. I'm showing you. Listen, we don't see it. We're not able to envision it until he reveals it through our suffering, through our daily life, the inability to, to overcome the difficulties of life on our own. We can't see it. And then he puts it in our, He puts the thorn in your life, and you can't get there on your own, and you're like, help me, help me, help me. He said, I am helping you. I am helping you. Paul said, I remembered what the Lord said. And this is what he did. He listened to the Holy Spirit. Because those words, those insights only come from the Holy Spirit. The old man and the unbeliever can't produce divine viewpoint. Can't do it. When you go to yourself and try to go through your inventory of ideas and you're listening to yourself and you're talking to yourself and you're telling yourself all that negative stuff, you're not going to find anything helpful. What you're going to do is you're going to pull out that old idea, that old program, and you're going to practice it again and again and ingrain it more and more and more, and everyone around you is going to be suffering with you. And everyone around you is going to be sad to see you come, and they're going to go, oh, boy, here we go. I was going to talk about his dead gum knees again. I know that's what my wife thinks. She thinks, no, he's going to talk about everything, all that stuff. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to talk about that anymore until about 10 minutes from now. God said in the perfect tense, these are the lessons that Paul had learned before. He'd already learned this. That's the point. He'd already learned it once. He'd already learned it many times. And he remembered What is he teaching me? What are we learning here? First lesson is my grace is sufficient. Whoa, what does that mean? My power is perfected in weakness. Boy, that's an even more mysterious. Now, secondly, the divine motive behind every aspect of God's plan is to bless his children. Just like you, Wonderful parent that you are, you love your children, you want nothing but good for them. 
we want nothing but good for them. It's hard for them to remember that. When you bring discipline, it's hard for them to recall and remember that everything that you're doing is trying to do good to them. But it's the same with God. He answers our prayers according to what is best for us in spite of what we ask for. James says you ask for the wrong things because you got wrong motives that you may spend it on your desires, your pleasures. You're just wanting to, you want stuff to indulge yourself. Listen, you ask God that you can win the lottery not because you're envisioning helping all these poor missionaries all over the world. I mean, I'm seeing the bass boat. Black bass boat, black truck, matching wheels. <laughs> Lord said, son, I'd never get you back to the study. Paul's weakness for boasting could have caused mission failure had, he not, had, he remo had God removed the thorn. And this is mission failure stuff here. He had a great mission. He had an incredible mission. Had God not put the thorn, he, listen, he could have gone through mission failure. But it would have been critical. Of course, he'd have passed, look, God would have passed it on to someone else. Writing this for our sake was too big and too important for God to let that not happen. Not going to happen. Look, you don't want the mission and all that's involved in it? Tell the Lord, I don't want the mission. Pass it on. Listen, and don't you dare do that. It would be the biggest regret of your life. That you passed up your opportunity to honor God because you weren't willing to suffer a little bit. Paul's runs been studying Romans 8. He shared with me. Romans chapter 8. Let me read you something. Really, really important stuff. Oh. Verse 18, Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us or in us or through us. What we're going through now in order that we might be ministers for the Lord is nothing compared to the greatness that's going to be shown through our life. <clears throat> Stop allowing your suffering to distract you from your mission. Stop allowing the potential of some great, wonderful pleasure to distract you from your mission. Listen, and I know, listen, there is some real suffering in this room. Real suffering. Real suffering. I appreciate Michelle. She's allowed me to use her life as an example of her sweet daughter that grew up here, was so beautiful that just has now turned into a great, beautiful woman. But whew, hard times. I talked to her through a little window that big. Stood there for an hour talking to her through that little window in, in the jail. That's suffering. When your baby has made choices that can't be unmade. That's suffering. Listen, hang in there. God is allowing for good. Now, <clears throat> Paul's initial view of what good was changed when he listened to the Holy Spirit in his prayer, when he, when he dialogued with the Spirit, see, his initial view of good was to remove the suffering. That would be good, Lord. <clears throat> That'd be good, Lord, if we could get rid of some of this suffering. And the Lord said, no, 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 son. Let me tell you what good is. Let me remind you, we've already learned this before about grace and about power and weakness, let me remind you of what real good is. In Romans 8, 29 through 39, since God is for us, who can be against us? That's good. You want to talk about something good? Hey, is God for you? You a believer in Jesus Christ? 
Have you been given his righteousness? God's for you. He's on your team. He's always on your team and will be forever and ever. And no matter what you do or how you fail, he's going to be your father. He's going to pick up your little mess and all of your pieces and put it back together for you in a way that honors him and furthers you. What a great person he is. Thirdly, the battlefield of the angelic conflict. Listen, this is where we win or lose. Every one of us, listen, Christ has already won. Amen. He's already won. He already won the war. The war is over. This is mopping up. But each one of us gets a chance to enter into this battle and test our mettle against the demons and the devil. We get to test not ourselves, but the value of God's word and God's grace. We get to take God's grace, ministered through his word, and put it to the test against the armies of evil. You get to do that. It's like you've been given this system that we live in. It's like you've been given this incredible weapon, this incredible weapon system. You ever seen the guys on the little computers on the shooting games? You've been given the system that, I mean, if you pull it out, it's like you got guns everywhere. Spiritual guns everywhere to shoot these demons down. You've been given power. Incredible stuff. And the battlefield is in the soul. Battlefield's not in your pocketbook. It's not in the bank account. It's not in those extra bills you couldn't pay this month. Listen, it's not, it's not in there. There's no battle there. The battle's in your soul. Win or lose, it's in your soul. In Luke chapter 10, he sent out the 70. They had power over, they came back and said, we had power over demons. We cast them out. Every form of evil we encountered, we had power over. And he said, that's really neat, guys. But don't boast about that. Boast that your name's written in the book of life. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 19, we're talking about the armor of God. Every believer is allowed to fight his or her part of the angelic conflict, and you get to choose to win or lose based on Christ. You can choose to trust and obey the Lord, and when you do, you vindicate his assertion that his righteous judgments are true. He, he passed sentence on the devil, and the devil said, You are unfair. You are unfair. I should have the right to do as I please and be independent from you. And yet you insist that you're going to be in charge and in control of every molecule of existence. It's mine. I made it. I'm going to do with it what I want to, including you. Now you can go with it or you can suffer with it. The devil said, I think I'll, I think I'll be like the most high. I think I'll rise above you, most high. What a fool. In Romans 8, 29, God's plan, turn to that please real quickly, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Let me show you what the mission is, what the plan is. Romans 8, 29, your battle is whether you're going to follow this course or not. In, in verse 29, Verse 28, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined that they would become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. The goal of the Christian life is to grow spiritually to become into the image of Christ. We start out, as soon as we're saved, he enters us into this transformation process where we grow, 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 grow until we die. And then in heaven, he completes the work. In 1 Thessalonians, he's our second, he says that I know God who started this work will, will continue to work on it until it's done. 
He keeps working and working and working. And the goal is for you to grow spiritually, become a mature believer, and, and become like Christ in, the, in your heart of hearts. Smoking in this house. His plan is to transform every believer into the exact image of Jesus Christ. We've been foreordained that we would be conformed to the image of His Son. And this is about spiritual growth, reaching maturity, and beyond. In 2 Corinthians 2 and Ephesians 6, we know the devil has schemes intended to hinder us from accomplishing this. His scheme is to divide us up. Listen, this is a team project. It's a team project. Spiritual gifts of behind this pulpit is only one of nine. Spiritual gifts are required to take any believer from day one, fill with old man stuff, all confused and, and deceived and, and habitually wrong, and turn us into somebody free of all that, filled with goodness and righteousness and habitually honoring and humble to the Lord. That's the goal. Now, it takes, it takes everybody takes every gift. It takes a whole church. God has given everybody an abundance of something. God has given me an abundance of hunger to, to learn and grow and understand and to share and teach. I can't stop. My children get on to me because I can't not teach. Dad, your talk, what you call a talk is an instructional manual. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't stop doing it. It's what I do. Everybody's begin to, been given an abundance of something, and whatever that is in your life, that's what you're to give. Your gift is the channel to touch other believers. Now, the soul is control. Let's talk about the soul. Listen to me. I know, I know we've been here a little while. I know we've been here a little while. If I had a joke, I'd tell you a joke. I can dance. Would you like for me to dance? You're going to say no? Thank you. All right. All right. I'm just trying to give the, just trying to let us. Whew. Can I turn the fans on? Do y'all mind? Can I take my shirt off? <laughs> Just kidding now. Now, let's talk about the soul. How does the soul work? See, I spent years figuring out how does the soul work. Father, show me, show me, show me. Both the old man, no wait, the soul is controlled by whichever belief system we're using in the moment as content for our inner dialogue. You got two systems. The first one can't, listen, initially, spiritually dead, you built the old man system. You built it out of all the stuff in the world in order to gain your own ideas to live your life. Problem is, none of them were from God. Best you could do was divine establishment principles. Day you got saved, Holy Spirit comes, now you can hear this, the divine viewpoint you can begin to put the new man together concept 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 but you've been living this one so long that it's just your habit of life it's just your habit you don't believe it to be true anymore except in the moment when the pressure comes you revert to it next thing you know you're using anger again and you go why did I do that habit just pure habit. It's not because you still believe that's the right thing to do or a good thing. It's just habit. Now you've got to break that pattern and remove it and replace it with the divine strategy of love which says anger, you don't need anger. Quit being that way. Use love. Use kindness. Use compassion. Be Be gentle. Use that strategy. That's a great strategy. Builds people up. 
This one over here tears them down. Therefore, that's where we started, and that's the goal is to tear this one down and replace it with this one. Simple as that. Now, look, if you, if you think you can get by without dealing with this one over here, just ignore it and pretend it's not there, it won't work. You end up with this back and forth life. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You never get victory. Oh, no matter how far you go down the line, if you leave this stuff in place, it'll come back and bite you. Sure did Paul in Jerusalem. Now, <clears throat> Romans chapter, go to Romans 6 real quick. Y'all go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, get us there real quick and then we're going to quit. I'm going to let you eat a donut. Romans 6, verse 16. Here are the pages, all right. Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, you become slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? What he's talking about here is the concept of habituation. When you, you, when you present yourself to an idea again and again and again and again to use this idea to live your life, it turns into automatic thinking and just habit. You just automatically go there. If you were a golfer, we'd call it muscle memory. But in your brain, it's just brain, you know, it's just mental memory. It's just how you've done it so many times. And listen, your brain, your physical brain, has literally lined up neurons, grown neurons together specifically to handle that idea. So that when you are faced with a situation, those neurons fire automatically. Boom. And you go, why did I do that? Boom. Because it's habit. That's, that's called slavery. Paul called it, you, you become a slave. Whatever you give yourself to, you become a slave to. And you got to break that slavery. Now that you have the spirit and the truth, you're able to break it. Before you couldn't, it's all you had. Now you can break it. Now stick with me one second. In the Old Testament, specifically, there is a phrase called, He said in his heart. In Roman, Genesis 8, 21, the phrase is used of the Lord. The Lord said in his heart. He said to himself inside of himself. In Genesis 17, 17, Abraham said in his heart. In fact, Abraham laughed in his heart. So did Sarah. God came along. He's 199. He says, you're going to have a son. Through Sarah. And they both thought it was the funniest thing. Of course, they, weren't, they, they wouldn't laugh out loud, but they laughed inside. It's called inner dialogue, where we talk with ourselves. C is visually, Ephesians 1.18, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. So here's what we're saying. This battlefield that your soul... You win or lose based on the inner dialogue and the inner imaging that you, and you're in control of it. You're in charge of it. Jesus is the captain of the ship, but you're the steersman. And whatever you say to yourself again and again is going to steer the ship and become who you are. It's just that simple. Hebrews 5.14 talks about our faculties are exercised, and he talks about it in the perfect tense because in the perfect tense we reach a state of habituation where we just do whatever we do automatically, just over and over again, over and over again, until we break the pattern and replace it. Paul learned, point five, he learned to listen in prayer, not just to talk. He learned to listen, to gain insight into what God was doing in his life. You know, he finally asked the right question. He said, Father, will you take this away? Would you take this away? Would you please take this away? And he finally said, wait a minute, wait a minute. When he says no, 
because he normally says yes when I ask for the right thing, but he keeps saying no. What are we doing here, Father? What is this for? Oh, I remember now. Everything's for good. This has some good purpose. Tell me, Father, what's the good purpose for this chronic illness? What's the good purpose? The Lord said, because if I didn't do something like that, you'd be out spouting how great you are all over the world. The whole Romans chapter so-and-so would be nothing about Paul, but Paul's greatness. Now, he learned to listen. This, this word in Romans 12, 9, when he said, He, God had said, it's perfect tense, meaning he had said in the past, and the Holy Spirit brought the principle back to his, remind, his remembrance. You know, he does that recall ministry. He was sitting there listening to the Lord in prayer, and the, and the Holy Spirit reminded him. He said, everything that we do is for good. The Spirit is the inside agent of the Godhead, empowering us to understand the truth. He communicates truth in, to us. Listen now. Listen to me for just one second, and then I'm going to quit. Just a second. The Spirit speaks to you in the moment. I mean, in the now. If you're not focused on the Spirit right now, in this moment, if you're in the past or you're in the future, He can't speak to you. Because you can't hear He's speaking. Hello. But you can't hear Him because you're way up there or you're way back there. You gotta be you gotta be living in the moment. When we live in the moment, you can hear him. Paul got back to the moment. All right, Father, what are we doing? And the Spirit said, Okay, finally, good question. Let me answer that for you. He said, My grace, what I've given you, I've in, what I've empowered you with is sufficient for you to deal with this situation. You don't need me to take it away. You don't need me to take it away. Stop asking. Wrong, wrong, wrong request. He says, my power is perfected in weakness, meaning that when I'm weak, actually helpless, I can let God be strong. When I quit looking to myself to fix the problems in my life, I can finally step back and ask God to fix them and let him do them, fix them his way. That's when the will of God gets done in your life. That's when you finally ask the question, Father, what are we doing here? I don't understand what we're doing. And you go, okay, I'm going to be quiet and listen. Show me what we're doing. And he'll open, the, he'll open the eyes of your heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart and show you. Here's what we're doing. Here's the plan. Now, are you going to be with me? Are you going to you be petulant? a petulant child that didn't get their way and fuss with me about it. What are you mad about in your life? What's happened in your life that's, that's caused you to shut down on God? That was so much, so great that you said His grace is not sufficient for this. Oh yeah, your grace is not for this. This is too much. God, too much for me to stand. <laughs> Papa, had all I can stand, he can't stand no more. And what would he do? Pull out his spinach, right? Squeeze that can and boom. Boom, boom. That spinach is the Holy Spirit in prayer. Let's pray. Father, what a great privilege to see new faces and to speak to people across the world talk about you, to try to reveal some of the mystery, to open up the secret of prayer, how we need to listen maybe more than we speak. Prayer is about getting your will to our life, not our will to yours. I just ask, Father, that you give us great wisdom about this and through this. And I pray now that you help us who have been given an abundance financially to be generous, to understand what that's what it's for. Not for piling up big, huge piles of green stuff, but 
to fund ministries and to help people take care of their families and all while they do work for you, Father. That's what it's for. So pray that you help us with that, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.